Hello, my name is Chad Jones. I'm Vice President of Strategy and Product Management with Dynamic Ops. Today we're going to look at transforming VDI into a virtual desktop cloud. Virtual desktop infrastructure, also known as VDI, is an interesting concept that a lot of enterprises are looking at. The ability to centralize your Windows desktops into a central hosted infrastructure and be able to gain management and agility benefits is really an interesting concept. However, when these enterprises have more than one data center, you quickly run into issues. The vision of any desktop anywhere at any time doesn't exactly do well with the speed of light problem. When I have a data center in New York and a data center in London and users traveling all over the world, performance can become an issue. Not to mention, you want to be able to easily set up and manage those desktops, which can actually run into the tens of thousands, depending upon your size of implementation. So what we're going to show you today is how the Dynamic Ops Cloud Automation Center can help with a virtual desktop infrastructure by transforming it into the virtual desktop cloud. So let's take a look. So what you see on your screen now is our interface into the Cloud Automation Center. So I'm logged in as a typical user, Dan. So let's say that Dan actually requires the use of a virtual desktop. So Dan will go into his self-service portal. And you'll notice there's just a couple items here. It's very simple for Dan. He's not an IT person. So first of all, he'll go in and take a look at his machines and see if he's already got a virtual desktop there. Turns out he doesn't. He does have a few other types of machines, virtual, physical, he can manage as well as cloud, which is actually our Amazon EC2 capability. Uh, but now Dan goes in and says, you know what? I need to actually request my virtual desktop. Let's go into request machine. And you'll see that there are two sets of blueprints that are shown to Dan, one from consulting services and one to development, one from development. So we're going to go into consulting services and look through his service catalog. And we'll notice that there's the mobile desktop. That's the one he needs. Now, that's a virtual desktop uh, that allows you to have two to four CPUs, two gigs of RAM, some storage. And you can see that the daily cost is actually $3.30, kind of expensive desktop. So if we go inside of here to request this machine, you'll notice that he can request multiple machines uh, if so desired. Doesn't need them in this case. A couple of CPUs, and then a description for what he needs that machine for. I am going to travel to Europe, right? So he needs that because he's going on a trip, and he needs to make sure he's going to be able to access his desktop remotely. So we'll go ahead and say OK. Now, what has happened is that on the background, the system has actually taken that, done a full audit trail of that request, and has begun to spun up that machine for Dan. Now, what we'll see here is the request for his actual mobile desktop. Now, it's, this, it's in the process of setting up the OS here. It's because he's going to travel to Europe, and away it goes. It was just that fast. So let's see how we set this up on the back end. So now, if we look at the Enterprise Administrator portal, and we go into the navigation for setting up the system, the first thing we did was create a reservation. The reservation defines where the virtual resource can sit. So now let's go ahead and look inside of here. And we can see that defined inside of here are many locations, but relevant to that ESX host, we find our services ESX and can say, let's edit that. Now inside of here, you can see that we have a reservation policy that's a tier one resource. What's the quota for the number of machines that I can actually place onto this system or onto this piece of fabric? What's the priority? What's the amount of memory that I've limited? What are the costs for my storage? What network can I actually sit on? And I can add custom properties on top of there as well. Again, defining where this resource can actually sit. We then go in to define the who, and that's our provisioning group. So if we look at the consulting services provisioning group, we'll see that we've defined inside of this group uh, the users, who, which Dan is a part of. And of course, you'd use Active Directory groups instead of individual users, but you do have that option. The support role, so uh, what users can actually shadow a user in case they're having difficulties. And the group manager role, or the group provisioning manager. Now, they're a non-IT person that oversees a group of users and can do approvals and look at their own particular set of machines for cost to make sure that they're on their own budget. So now from there, 
we go into the build profile. And we can actually look at what it takes to build a Windows desktop. Inside of here, you can see that we have different sets of custom properties. So instead of having to worry about how a machine is built in its image, or if I'm gonna to have to create sysprep uh, scripts or anything like that, we simply load in any of the relevant property sets that define how a machine is actually built. You then go in and actually define what those parameters are in a text-based way. Again, no coding, no scripting, anything like that. So now, once those are defined, you tie together all of those elements in a blueprint. The blueprint describes the what of the system. So now when we look at the mobile desktop, and we go inside of here and edit the principal properties, you can see who, what groups uh, from our provisioning groups have the right to actually see this blueprint and request the machine. Is there an approval policy? What's the machine prefix? We'll just use the one from the build profile in this case. What's the max number of machines per user? Is there an archival process? From the build information, are there any minimums or maximums? Are we creating it? How are we creating that? You can see here that we're using WIM. We also support cloning, link cloning, and uh, sheer copying of those VMs. Uh, you can add custom properties. What's the daily cost? Uh, you can go and actually define the security as well. You can see that really you've limited the virtual desktop security here. However, if you wanted that user Dan to be able to destroy the machine or control power on, power off, shut down, and suspend, you could change those properties, say OK, and it will go back and apply to existing machines as well. So now we've fully defined how you're able to create a virtual desktop service. And someone can simply come in, request the machine without having to talk to IT, and then manage the lifecycle of that as defined by IT. If we go back to our user Dan, you can see if we refresh here and go back into My Machines, that now his virtual desktop is on and he is able to connect to that machine as well. Now we integrate with Citrix systems as well, Zen Desktop, so that if this were present on this machine, it would actually register that virtual desktop with the Zen Desktop broker and associate it with the user Dan. So that user can go to the Zen Desktop portal, log in, and get the Zen Desktop experience. Again, all controlled through the Dynamic Ops Cloud Automation Center. This really allows you to gain full and efficient control over your virtual desktop environment where there can be tens of thousands of virtual machines. One of our own customers has a virtual desktop cloud of over 100,000 machines. And they're able to manage that as efficiently as if they were managing one. So through the demonstration, we've shown you how you can easily and powerfully control a virtual desktop infrastructure. Through the Cloud Automation Center, you're basically able to transform a virtual desktop infrastructure into a virtual desktop cloud that's globally available for your entire enterprise. My name is Chad Jones, and thank you very much for taking the time to join us for this video today.